Hi guys, second video of the day. I know most of you are probably even shocked. You're like, oh, he actually uploaded twice today? Yes, I did. This is Hospital Survival Guide Season 1, Episode 6. I guess I'm running out of fingers. We have to do the season finale. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we actually look at how to survive in medical school, how to survive in the hospital area and not just limited to medical school but even those that have newly graduated and are pretty much preparing themselves for what is known as internship. I had a poll on my channel and I actually thought this could be actually the next hospital survival guide edition on my channel and these were the results. Apparently there's a proportion, a large proportion of you actually want to know how to prepare for internship and there are some people who actually don't know what internship is and there are some people who voted no. I wonder who those people are. I am watching you. I am watching you. Anyways, so with that vein, I came up with this episode of pretty much how to prepare for internship, how to survive internship, medical internship. Before I get into actually details of this, again, if you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content. Every time I post, there are some days when I will be making double uploads like today, where I'm not so busy. And yeah, drop a like, drop a comment, show your support. So before we actually go into details of the video, I just want you to actually give you some perspective of the terminology that we actually use in medicine, especially in our region. So remember that First and foremost, you're going to be in medical school for, for quite a number of years. At some universities, they do it for six years. At some universities, it actually is done for seven years. But I think the curricula is slowly changing such that all the universities now are inclining towards the six-year medicine. Whichever one you do, six years or seven years, the difference is quite minimal. You still get the same qualification. The weight of the paper is still the same. So after you complete your internship, suppose you're training here in Zambia, in any university in Zambia here, be it Lusaka Apex Medical University, University of Zambia, the Copper Belt University, Mulungushi, and a big shout out to any other medical university here, Tixela, Unilas, that is in the country. Once you complete your medical school, of course, you're going to have to do your, what do you call that thing again? What do they call it? Is it, um, the licensure exam, okay, yes, the licensure exam, sorry about that, the licensure exam that you have to write and then once you pass that, because I hear that's going to be introduced very, very soon, so if you're still in school and you haven't written exams, pray. <laughs> Anyways, you should subscribe to the channel, we'll, we'll discuss these things, don't worry. So you will write the licensure exams and then after you write the licensure exams, and you pass that, what you're going to receive is what is referred to as a temporal provisional registration. You're not really a complete doctor, somehow. Medicine is a scam, maybe. So you're not really a complete doctor because you still have to work under apprenticeship of someone else, under the supervision of someone else for a duration of one year, six months. Now, this is the big difference. If you're trained here in Zambia, you're going to do internship for one year, six months. If you're trained outside the country, outside Zambia, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in China, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in the US, whether it's in the UK, and you want to come and do your internship here in Zambia, you're going to be required to do your internship for a minimum of two years. So it means six months in each rotation, six months in obstetrics and gynecology, six months in surgery, six months in internal medicine, and six months in pediatrics. If you're trained locally, you're pretty much going to be doing three months in internal medicine, three months in pediatrics, six months in obstetrics and gynecology, six months in surgery. So the surgical departments are six months each and the medical departments are pretty much three months each. Now, after you have completed your internship successfully, you now get your full registration. Now, this full registration now allows you to work without super supervision because you now become, um, you're no longer an intern. You uh, become a general medical officer. So pretty much you're going to be Working without supervision, that's where you can actually even leave the country after some time. If you get your papers well with HPCZ, you may also decide to further your education and go back to school. But you have to at least work for a minimum of two years, what is known as the rural posting period, where you, you work in a, in a rural setup. And then after that, you can be posted anywhere you want to go. You can leave the country. You can go study your master's in medicine. You can go and uh, pretty much join an NGO. You can even work in the private sector. 
So once you go back to study, go back to school to do your postgrad. When you get in, as you are ascending, you become a junior registrar. When you finish, eventually you become the senior registrar. And then with time, that's how you become a consultant. So pretty much you, you and I are probably stuck at, at um, certain levels. If you just finished school, then you're probably just starting internship. There are other people that are at different levels of internship. So I hope that clears all the misconception of what internship is. So now, how exactly are you going to prepare for this internship such that you can maximize your internship, so that you don't delay yourself? Because um, consultants do say that you're not ready and you can't move on to the next department. How awkward would that be? You become what we call a chronic intern. I, I used to know someone, anyways, I'm not going to talk about that. I am not going, I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying to be a good person for a change. So you may become a chronic intern. Please do not become a chronic intern. This advice is just to help you navigate the different rotations based on the internship, based on the little clinical experience that I've actually gathered post medical school. So first and foremost thing is what to expect. Now, what do I mean by what to expect? The leap or the difference between being a student in medical school versus you working is quite huge. The responsibility is quite huge. Picture this, you're on a cold day and you're tired, you're a student, you ask the doctor, can I leave? And the doctor will be like, you already want to leave? It's, it's only 16 hours. Okay, you can go. You're no longer supposed to do that because you're now responsible for the patients. Most of the times it's the interns that are going to be there in the hospital, so the, 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 the leap and the progression from being a student to being a doctor and having all of these responsibilities on you is quite drastic. You won't be able to actually, sometimes you may find some difficulty adjusting. So on your core days and your, depending on whether you're in a surgical department or a medical department, if you're in a surgical department, generally you're going to be, have to be assisting on certain procedures and learning certain procedures. Please do not be afraid to ask your registrar if you do not know certain procedure or even your colleague that has been there to actually guide you on the certain procedures. I had wonderful colleagues when I was working some time back who actually guided me with certain procedures and until I found my feet. So do not be afraid to actually ask these colleagues. So you, you would expect a lot of responsibility. You're going to expect to take care of all your patients and of course there should be some di division of labor in your unit depending on how many doctors you're posted with. You'll be lucky if you actually start with new people, maybe actually even unlucky if you start with new people. If you find someone there who's very helpful, it's very good. Clinical experience is actually going to be great because you can easily consult this person. Moreover, if it's an intern, because we usually do this orientation thing, the new interns get taught by the old interns how things work, and then after that, maybe about two or three weeks, you get used to the system, then you'll be working on your own, then you become the old intern in that unit, and you teach the new interns that come how things go, and that's how the circle of life actually is in the hospital. So, the, the cold days are, are rather hectic, especially your, your first cold day will be quite hectic as, as an intern, and pretty much you get home very tired. So if you live very far from the hospital, I would suggest you move much closer to the hospital so that you can cut on the journey because I stay very, I used to stay very far from my hospital to where I stay at home. So I was constantly tired. So move closer to the hospital. If you are moving to the hospital flats, that's even better. If you have a means of transport or a car that you can drive, then drive there, that, that's okay, then you don't have to really get so tired with boarding taxis or maybe boarding buses or maybe even strapping. There are some people who do strap and who do walk. So that's the first and foremost thing. And then the second thing is actually relating to the work itself. Working is actually unbelievably easier than learning medicine. Very, very easy. I can assure you. So what things do you actually need for you to survive the load to for you to survive working in the hospital environment. The first thing that I want you to, to actually collect is what are known as protocols. So these are just like guidelines which are pretty much going to be helping you understand what exactly we will do in specific situations, especially in internal medicine and pediatrics, those things will work wonders. Even obstetrics and gynecology, they are there is a protocol for obstetrics and gynecology that we have where you are following the one from UTH that may also help you guide you. It's, it's actually brief, straight to the point. Get that? It will help you with exactly how you're going to be managing certain scenarios. The second thing that I want you to make 
you accompany you with is of course your BNF, your British National Formulation or Formulary. I don't, I always confuse what it actually stands for. But it will just pretty give you a, a bunch of drugs that um, dosages, adverse effects, indications where you can actually look up the dosages. You can actually even get an app. I think they do have an app. But there are some apps that I love to use that are my go-to apps when I'm in the hospital and dealing with the hospital. So I shall put screenshots on the screen right now. So this is the first app and this is the second app and this is the third app. So these apps, I really want you to get these apps if you can get them on Android. I don't know if they're present on Android because um, we don't do that here. Android, what is that? Anyways, it, it, I can assure you that they are on iOS, or on those that are on Apple devices, those that are on Android devices, I think they should also be on Android devices. So please get these apps. You should be referring to them. They will help you with the dosaging. They will help you with the different conditions. And actually, they are pretty awesome. And they have helped me during the procedure. So that's how you actually learn the dosages. And the, the quicker you actually learn the dosages, the better it will be for you. And here's a rule of thumb, here's some tricks that I actually learned. Suppose you get a difficult case and you are afraid to actually tell the patient that I don't know what you have. You could simply send the patient to go get investigations done first. Then as the patient is gone to go get investigations done, you can consult, that's, that's the time where you can actually make a phone calls. Hello, Dr. Kazevo, where are you? I have a patient. Um, this, this and that, what should I do? What's the diagnosis? That's where you can call your boss, you can call your colleagues, and you can even sometimes check up a few things from your notes or check up a few things from the apps that I've just shown you. So that's pretty much a, a trick that I learned, especially when I was working as uh, an intern at one point. Um, then once you now have this, the third thing that I can also assure you that you should do is always be punctual and follow the rules. What do I mean by punctual and following the rules? Never be late. Interns are not supposed to be late. You're always supposed to be reporting at the hospital before preferably even your boss gets there. So if the hospital you're supposed to be reporting at 8 hours, make sure by 7.50 you're there. If it's even in the major ward round in certain departments like obstetrics and gynecology where there is a handover, make sure that you're there even much, much earlier. By seven hours, you're already at the hospital so that you already have a grip on things that are supposed to be presented to you or things that are supposed to be handed over to you. Worse off on major ward rounds, make sure that all your patients are prepared, all investigations are ready, make sure that all patients are clerked, all everything, the, the files are in order for the major ward round because they do shout, yo consultants talk a lot so make sure that everything is ready if you're in surgical departments like obstetrics and gynecology and surgery make sure that before the theater days you make the list you take the list to the, the appropriate places the wards the hcc before you the patients actually are to go to theater the next day and make sure that all the investigations are actually done for the patients before the theater day because you can cancel your cases because maybe there's no full blood count that was done for this patient. So make sure that you draw all the bloods, draw all the necessary investigations before and push for blood for this patients before they actually go to theatre. And that's the other thing that I can actually observe you. So actually show up to work, don't be scared and have as much fun as possible. Don't be afraid to not know things. Consult with someone. Do not write things that you're not so sure. Do not give drugs that you're not so sure. If you're not so sure about the dosage, please consult. You're safer Googling the dosage rather than guessing the dosage and giving this patient the wrong dosage. So please check these things with your bosses. Check these things with your colleagues. Check these things with the apps that I showed you and confirm before you actually give a patient certain medication to actually go home. Always be punctual, dress well, and I wish you all the best. It's actually a pleasure to work as a doctor. I can assure you it is tiring. There are some downfalls about it. Oh, one more thing before I actually close this video. The last thing, point number four, dealing with the depression and dealing with the death. I don't think this is something that you actually is really emphasized in medical school. What do I mean? You will have some situations where a patient dies and you are the one who has to break the bad news to the family. So prepare yourself psychologically for that. There are some times where you're going to be actually having to break bad news to almost like 
a lot of different people, especially in the medical departments, especially in internal medicine, where a lot of patients actually die. Like a lot of patients die. In surgery, we rarely see patients actually dying. I think when I was in surgery, the only time a patient ever died, I think, was because they went, they became septic, and they had their wounds became infected. And I think I only witnessed two patients, two or three patients dying. But when we switched now to the COVID department, yo, oh my goodness, we were breaking bad news to individuals on almost a daily basis. So prepare yourself mentally, find a way to actually unwind after work and actually deal with this depression and deal with this anxieties and deal with the sad part about medicine. So please do not fall into depression, do not fall into anxiety. Find someone you can talk to, find something that can unload your stress. And I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Hospital Survival Guide. If you did, please consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to receive your notifications of such amazing content. Every time I post, drop a like, drop a comment to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.